Welcome to Wednesday's edition of COVID-19. We've marked a grave milestone for the year today with our tally hitting 1,212 today. Now this comes amid efforts elsewhere to ease social restrictions as was the initial plan here in Korea before the sudden resurgence. We'll start now with the pandemic updates with our Kwon so Now so we've spoken of this pattern of high numbers on Wednesday, but a number above a thousand was something I was not expecting. Same here, Sonia. And I remember how you texted me yesterday showing me the figure accumulated until 6 p.m. yesterday, and that's when we already had over 1,000 infections. So, uh, as Sonny said, even considering that today is a Wednesday when usually we are seeing a rise in cases after the beginning of the work week, today really we are seeing a skyrocketing figures in just one day with cluster infections infections breaking out, for instance, in the capital Seoul at a large department store as well as a shopping mall and also more infections linked to existing clusters, also new clusters, including at schools and restaurants and also a dozen of newly enlisted soldiers at a boot camp have been confirmed as of this Wednesday. So 1,212 is the figure we are seeing as of 12 a.m. and that marks the second highest figure of daily infections here in Korea since the first outbreak in January last year. So that's the highest since December 25th when we had over 1,200 cases. And the number of domestic cases this Wednesday alone stands at above 1,100. So uh, with that, uh, since last Wednesday, we are seeing infections having already been on a quite high level here between the 700s and the 800s even. And now we are seeing an on-week jump by more than 4 400 cases. So with that, the total number of infections here in the country stands at 162,753. The good thing is, however, that the death toll has been dropping recently with just uh, one fatality reported in the past day. I'm saying just one because compared to the high number of daily infections. Now, uh, in the capital region, we are especially seeing resurgences with 85% of cases when it comes to domestic cases occurring here in the capital Seoul, Gyeonggi-do province and Incheon. So 990 domestic cases in this part of the country. That is also a record high. And uh, we've been jumping from the 300s to the 500s in the capital Seoul and from the 200s to the 300s in Gyeonggi-do province. Right, so and that grave situation has prompted the nation's top office to call for prompt and strong measures. Right, Sunny. Uh, President Moon Jae-in this uh, Wednesday gave a special order just hour after today's figures came out, and he has urged on preemptive measures by authorities and also on cooperation by the nation's people to abide by social distancing measures. And here's more from the spokesperson of the presidential office of Chongade. We'll expand our contact tracing capacity and mobilize the military, police and civil service personnel to quickly find our sources of infection. Under the Enhanced Infectious Disease Prevention Act, we will adopt a zero-tolerance policy on distancing rules of violations, which will carry a penalty of 10-day business suspensions. And that measure, among other prevention rules concentrated in the capital region, kicks in on Thursday. And also beginning Thursday, the current social distancing measures will be extended for another week, meaning no private gatherings of four or more people and also most venues will have to close at 10 p.m. Now, the government will analyze the worsening situation in the greater Seoul area to decide on whether to apply the recently revised social distancing scheme or not. At the current situation, the highest of the new four-tier system is not being ruled out. Meanwhile, testings for the coronavirus are to be largely expanded, especially linked to high-risk facilities used by the younger population who have been getting together more frequently due to the summer vacation season. And that's also been attributed to the rise in cluster infections and even variant cases, including the Delta variant. Authorities are asking for those in their 20s and 30s to get tested even if they show no symptoms. And the president also earlier called on more anonymous testing to help encourage younger people to get tested. 
So more testings, but also more vaccinations. If we take a look at our latest updates, we've got 15.4 million people who received at least one shot of COVID-19 vaccine and also 5.4 million who are fully vaccinated with over 62,700 who have been fully vaccinated as of yesterday. Now, while Korea is also dealing with the spread of the Delta variant, as I mentioned before, it's the culprit of resurgences as many countries around the world. Now, Russia reported its highest daily death toll of over 730 on Tuesday. And on the same day, Indonesia has recorded over 31,000 daily infections, while Australia, also dealing with the Delta variant, says that it's not going to achieve herd immunity soon. And with 51% of recent cases being the Delta variant, it seems to have become the dominant strain in the U.S. Now, meanwhile, over in Japan, with just a little little over two weeks left until the Tokyo Olympics and with resurgences there too. Uh, it looks like many of its torch, public torch relay events on the streets have been canceled with Tokyo having almost 600 cases reported on Tuesday alone. And also recently, two people at the Olympic Village have tested positive there as well. Now also let's take a look at the global figures. Now we have the UK with 4.9 million infection and 28,000 cases is reported in the past day and there are uh, frightening expectations that this number could rise to 100,000 a day after social distancing measures are eased later this month and also many other countries are dealing with resurgences which is why on Wednesday we are, have been recording over 450,000 new cases uh, but despite this rise in daily infections the deaths uh, stay at around 8,000 and this is attributed to the vaccination drive in many countries. And those are the updates I have for now. Back to you, Sunny. All right, so well, thank you very much for the detailed update. My pleasure. Right, the Pfizer doses that Israel agreed to send to Korea under a vaccine swap deal have arrived here in the country. For more on that, I have Ji Abi Lee here in the studio with me. Welcome, Ji. Hi, Sunny. Right, then let's begin with the arrival of those vaccines. Sure, so earlier this morning at 7.15 local time, 700,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine have arrived at the Incheon International Airport. Korea will immediately put these vaccines to use and provide the same amount back to Israel between September and November. By then, the 700,000 inoculations will be more or less complete in the country. Korea is equipped with a temperature-controlled supply network known as a cold chain that will allow for a speedy and secure distribution of vaccines before expiry. Another consideration for the vaccine swap was the high rate of vaccine uptake here in the country. This makes it possible to use the vaccines within a much shorter time frame in Korea than in many other countries. The two countries have been discussing the vaccine swap since the launch of the COVAX facility. COVAX is a worldwide initiative aimed at equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines and was founded by four entities, including the World Health Organization. Here is KDCA Commissioner Chong explaining the two countries' efforts. In May, Korea and Israel held multiple discussions on vaccine cooperation through many occasions like the Israeli foreign minister's visit to Korea. These efforts have helped our two countries reach a vaccine swap deal. Right, indeed. So, G, where were these Pfizer vaccines manufactured and how will they ad be administered here in the country? Well, this particular batch was made in Belgium and approved by the Korean government. But not only that, Israel has been using the same batch for its citizens in July. And um, Seoul also announced yesterday the plans to allow emergency um, customs clearance for the shipment so the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety can inspect it as soon as possible. Once the ministry determines there are no defects or anomalies, the vaccines will be sent to inoculation centers nationwide from July 13th or in six days from today. The big question among journalists here was whether the shipment was part of the same batch that Palestine has rejected. Two weeks ago, the Palestinian Authority backed out of a similar agreement with Israel, saying the vaccines were too close to their expiration date, despite Israel using the same batch to vaccinate its teens. Ramallah rejected a first batch of some 100,000 doses that were set to expire at the end of June. But the health ministry in Jerusalem emphasized the Pfizer doses sent to Ramallah are identical in every way to the vaccines being given to Israeli citizens.
It's a standard practice to use vaccines that are close to its expiration date. As long as a date has not been passed, they are deemed perfectly safe to use. Right, and concerns over that particular date were also mm. brought up during Tuesday's afternoon briefing, right? Absolutely. So when the question was brought up at the briefing, KDCA Commissioner Chong said the batch sent to Korea is not the same batch that the Palestinian authorities have rejected. Let's hear from more. Let's hear more from her directly. When we take into consideration the time it takes for vaccines to be inspected and distributed, we only have about three or four months to use them before they expire. That being said, we do not expect any problems in using this particular batch of vaccines, which expires in one month. Right, and staying with vaccines, I believe authorities are planning to place priority on vaccinations here in the metropolitan region. Absolutely. So the decision comes on the back of about 80% of all new cases in the country coming from Seoul and its surrounding Gyeonggi province. The KDCA says people in their 20s and 30s are fueling the infections because most of them are not yet eligible for vaccinations. Pfizer doses enough to vaccinate 340,000 people will be distributed to Seoul and the surrounding Gyeonggi province this month. People in occupations with frequent person-to-person -person contact will be prioritized further with inoculation scheduled for two weeks starting the 13th. Each local government will have independent authority to decide on their own categorization of the most vulnerable occupations to the pandemic. There are 43 inoculation centers in Seoul and 51 in Gyeonggi province to support vaccination efforts. That's all for me today. All right, Ji, as always, thank you very much for the coverage. Thanks for having me. Right, elsewhere, Denmark is recording a rebound in daily infections with over 500 cases on Tuesday alone that authorities are linking to the Delta variant. Now, the resurgence also follows the detection of the Delta Plus variant late last month there. For more on the situation in Denmark, I have Professor Jans Ludgren at the University of Copenhagen live on the line. Welcome to the program, Professor Ludgren. Thank you very much for inviting me. Right, Professor, let's start with the Delta Plus variant that was recently reported there in Denmark. Yeah, I mean, we, we obviously have seen a, um, a switch uh, in, the, in the virus variant over the last month. Uh, so both the Delta and the Delta uh, plus variant has become the dominant uh, um, uh, virus in the community. Uh, and as we know that the variant is more infectious, uh, we see an upswing in transmissions, in particular among younger people, uh, I think similar to what you're observing in, in South Korea. I see. Now, Professor, I understand that information over the Delta Plus variant is lacking, but what has been shared so far? Well, so far, the, 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 the concept is that as long as you are vaccinated uh, uh, twice, uh, you have a very good protection also against the, the Delta Plus variant. Uh, so, uh, so far, we are not really concerned with the more vulnerable part of the population, uh, as we have been successful to vaccinate uh, that part of the population early on uh, in the year. Uh, uh, but given the fact that we had to prioritize a vaccination, uh, as I understand you have done in South Korea, the younger population have not yet been vaccinated, and that's why the transmission are thriving. But uh, we see, and therefore, an upswing in transmissions, but we don't see that translated into an upswing in admissions to hospital uh, because of the fact that we've been vaccinated in the more vulnerable part of the population. Uh, so obviously we are trying to rush as much as possible to get uh, further vaccinations into the into the shoulders of the population. Uh, we just got a million doses uh, in a swap with Romania actually uh, just uh, five days ago. So uh, we're really trying to accelerate vaccination uh, as much as possible also in the younger population to curb this offspring. I see. So vaccines, our current vaccines are effective against variants. Then what efforts are being made by perhaps by authorities in Denmark to encourage the younger population to get inoculated? Well, I, I think we have been really uh, I think fair in in the way that we have been communicating to the population that it's in everybody's interest uh, that we build up uh, immunity in the population as much as possible. Uh, 
while also accepting uh, that uh, vaccines have side effects and be very transparent about explaining that, but also that the benefits from receiving the vaccine uh, in terms of prevention uh, of infection, prevention of serious disease, as well as allowing society to open, uh, clearly outweigh uh, the, the potential side effects from the vaccine uh, and therefore have a open discussion around that. Uh, so I think so far, uh, support from the national vaccine program has been going uh, quite well. Professor Lidgren, is there a way to raise vaccine efficacy against variants, perhaps through the use of booster shots? Well, that's a good question. At the moment, I think the, the evidence tells us that you really need to make sure you get uh, two vaccines uh, into the shoulder of each person to really uh, get the, the vaccine effectiveness that we're looking for up in the high 80s and 90 percentage. Uh, if you only have one shot uh, and still waiting for the second shot, there is less of a protective ability, uh, in, in particular for um, infections, uh, which may or may not have symptoms, but clearly where people are still potentially infectious and therefore can transmit the virus to others. So, so we are trying to, to, what can I say, complete our vaccination program uh, as quickly as possible and get both doses into the shoulders uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, so, so that's what we are really struggling with at the moment. Right. Aside from vaccinations, Professor, how else are authorities there seeking to strengthen their containment efforts against the pandemic? Well, that's, it's been a big debate in our country because we have been through a, um, a, a significant lockdown uh, over the, uh, our last winter here. And um, I think the population, to some extent, is a little tired <laughs> of handling uh, COVID and try to adjust the, their behavior for that. Uh, so we we tried to take it relatively easy. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, we're in the middle of a, a football championship and people are very excited and uh, so forth. So that may not really have helped in terms of containment of the transmission. But uh, so far, we have uh, most of the sort of day daily social activities open, uh, but it's trying to reduce the number of people who is gathering at big, um, big uh, gatherings uh, in the society. But it's a little difficult at the moment, given the uh, excitement of, of the European Championship. <laughs> right, I'm sure. I can just imagine. Professor, I believe the, uh, the mask requirement was largely lifted in Denmark back in mid-June. What are your thoughts on this personally? Well, it, it, it's correct. Uh, as a restrictive measure, it was lifted, uh, although it's still recommended to be used uh, in uh, if you are meeting uh, several people together and cert certainly in all uh, public transportation, uh, it's still required by mandate. My personal thought is that uh, given that we see an upswing in transmission, uh, that it is advisable uh, to uh, wear a mask uh, until we have uh, this uh, new surge uh, more contained. Uh, whether people are willing to do that in the middle of the summer, a hot summer, uh, is another matter, but uh, that would be my advice. I see. All right, Professor Lindgren, thank you very much for making the time to join us live at this very early hour at your end. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Bye -bye. Right now, back here on the local front, the pandemic has also brought about change in people's relationships with their pets. Now, we have more on the adoption and abandonment of our furry friends amid COVID-19 in this next report. The number of Koreans raising pets is nearing 15 million, and now we can easily find pet-friendly hotels and photo studios shooting pet portraits. And the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lifestyle, which inevitably affects our pets too. And today, together with my doggo, Pokshi, let's take a deeper look at those changes. This is a dog park located in Gyeonggi, the province. It's a weekday, but we could find a lot of people spending time with their pets. The pandemic has many people spending more time with their pets, as companies are allowing people to work from home and as social gatherings have been limited. Uh, 놀러 나와서 um, 기분 전환도 되고 um, 
재밌어서 나오게 돼요. <웃음> and the time spent with pets is found to be very helpful in overcoming a so-called corona blue. According to a survey of 320 pet owners, 91.6% of the respondents said that being with their pets helps overcome COVID-19. This is also true in other countries. A survey conducted by the Dog People showed that 92% of dog owners in the U.S. say that their dog has played a role in positively impacting their mental health since the pandemic began. In fact, more and more people spend free time with their pets at home. Taking care of their pets, such as walking and feeding, has allowed pet owners to keep a routine in place while staying at home. However, what is concerning is that the rate of pet abandonment also soared amid the booming of pet adoption. As of the end of August in 2020, the number of animals staying in shelters saw a six-fold increase compared to the same period the year before. There are about 200 abandoned dogs staying in the shelter. Just recently, someone left his dog named Toby abandoned outside the shelter. Pet abandonment is a crime, though. We see a significant rise in pets being abandoned, and one main reason is their owners facing financial hardship amid the pandemic. COVID-19 has also worsened the situation at the shelter. The intensified distancing measures has limited the number of volunteers at the shelter. Also, donations decreased as well. Corona, you know, I did 사람들도 이제 먹고 살기 힘들다 보니까 아무래도 후원금도 많이 줄어서 어, 요즘 많이 힘듭니다. In particular, as animal shelters in South Korea are usually private shelters, a decline in donations is critical to them. The prolonged pandemic is making even pets suffer. 지금 소유자가 어, 동물을 유기하면 안 된다는 생각을 가지고 동물을 키워야 되는 게 가장 중요합니다. 이를 위해서 지금 그 동물 유기하는 거를 범죄로 상향하는 법 개정도 이루어진 거고요. 궁극적으로는 유기 동물의 수를 줄이고 유기 동물을 좀 관리하기 위해서는 동물 생산 단계에서부터 어떤 제한이나 어, 당국의 관리가 필요합니다. Some worry that as offices and schools reopen and our social life returning to normal, some pet owners would cast aside their dogs and cats, resulting in a rapid increase in abandoned pets. This has been Shin Sebyeok. Based on the continuing downward trajectory of cases, the scientific data on the performance of our vaccines, and our understanding of how the virus spreads, that moment has come for those who are fully vaccinated. Many of us have been able to do this, but this situation has not been able to do this. The most important thing is that we have to do this in the future. Countries with high vaccination rates are seeking to re-establish a sense of normality by easing social restrictions. But given the presence of variants like the Delta, some are casting doubt on the wisdom of these efforts. For more on this, I have Professor, I have Doctor, that is, David Kwak from Sun Chiang University Hospital. Welcome back, Dr. Kwak. Good afternoon. And I also have joining this session virtually is Professor Peter Chin Hong at the University of California, San Francisco. Good to see you again, Professor Chin Hong. 
Thanks so much, Sunny. And I also have <laughs> Professor Dale Fisher at the National University of Singapore joining us live as well. Pleasure to have you with us again, Professor Fisher. Good to be back, Sunny. Right then, Dr. Kwok, we'll start, we'll start here in the studio. Korea's daily tally today stands at 1,212. Now, this is the highest, this is the highest, second highest that will be since the start of the pandemic here in Korea. What are your thoughts on our current situation? Well, I'm quite worried that, um, that I, because I anticipate it might actually go even higher. Uh, this number, I think, clearly comes from our complacency. As, as I mentioned a couple of times before, uh, I've seen people just really go, going back to their normal lives and gathering socially and, you know, going to bars and restaurants very freely. I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that, but I'm basically saying that we should uh, go back to the time where we were still being vigilant and being careful for each other, uh, having to worry for each other and making sure that we uh, physically put the barriers up and, and make sure that especially the elderly that are not affected from the virus. Uh, but at this point, I think that it's this season where people are being tired of um, the pandemic and all the restric restrictions already. And also it's the season where uh, we are seeing a lot of good news coming in from um, overseas globally. And uh, we're sort of in this mood where we also feel like we're one of them. Uh, but that is clearly not the case. We haven't uh, reached uh, very high numbers of uh, vaccinations so far the population, so which means that a lot of the people are still um, unprotected from the virus, and but still our minds are very free. So it's it's really the critical time. We should uh, let this, uh, let ourselves know really that uh, that it's not the best time to really hang out too much, uh, but also it's time that we also need to get get a hold of uh, as many vaccinations as possible to inoculate as many uh, greatest uh, portion of the po uh, population as possible as well. Indeed. Meanwhile, Professor Chen Hong, the gist of the presidential address on the 4th of July at the White House this past weekend was to announce America's independence from social distancing measures, including the mask mandate. What has been the general response to this? Uh, well, Sunny, uh, fighting for independence is never an easy proposition. And I think mask wearing is one of our best weapons apart from vaccines. You know, in terms of the public's reaction to the, you know, lowering of mask wearing uh, restrictions in the U.S., it's been taken with mixed reviews. I think it still falls along the lines of politics, of gender, with more democratic states uh, still continuing to wear masks, even if people are vaccinated and, uh, you know, more women than men. So I think uh, it's, you know, again, politics rules when it comes to mask wearing in the United States. And in fact, more than 2,400 uh, episodes of uh, non-mask wearing in planes with some citations and charging have been uh, recorded since the beginning of this year. And in fact, this led American Airlines and Southwest Airlines to ban the service of alcohol on these planes. Right. Professor Fisher, I understand Singapore is planning to drop its daily tally as part of efforts to resume normal life by treating COVID-19 like any other endemic disease. What is the background behind this plan and what changes does it entail? This is all about going into a, a transition phase. We, we know where we are now. Um, we're at 64% at, uh, first jabs and 38% uh, uh, fully vaccinated. Uh, our cases are running in the in the single digits most days now. We did get up to 30 or 40 cases a day recently with, with about 40 active clusters open. So ultimately we'll get to that point where really we're relying on vaccine alone and, and probably simple hygiene measures. But now what we're talking about is ramping up vaccines still and we're going faster now. Uh, continuing the public health measures of contact tracing, quarantine, things like that. But going forward, we want to de-emphasize the border controls and the social restrictions because they're the things with the social and economic impacts. So it's about uh, some of the measures coming up, some of the measures coming down. And as we get more vaccinated, we're going to see more transition, uh, transmission of very mild disease. And actually counting cases won't be so important. It'll be more about monitoring severe disease, deaths and indeed the number of people that are that are in those categories that are vaccinated versus unvaccinated so th there's no point in declaring a thousand cases a day for instance when you've only got a couple of people in hospital it uh, sends the wrong message so so the reporting will evolve as the interventions evolve 
Professor Fisher, and what is the public response to this initiative and what are your personal thoughts on the matter? Well, it's, it, it's clearly the way to go. I think every country uh, needs an exit strategy um, and, and figuring out how to do that, uh, how to do that transition, because it's going to take about, of course, you know, certainly several months to get from uh, 30 or 40% vaccinated up to our target of, of, of 80% vaccinated. So during that time, how much can you ease? Because people are tired of the social restrictions uh, and the border closures, which have got such a strong e economic and social impact. So we want to ease those off. And hopefully as the vaccine and the public health measures ongoing can take over doing the heavy lifting, we can ease some of the other things. So the the broad feeling in Singapore is 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 one of excitement, actually, that, uh, that that we're moving through this over the next few months. Right, Dr. Quark, what are your thoughts on the idea of lifting social restrictions following high vaccination numbers despite the spread of variants, which is precisely the case over in the UK? Well, I actually agree with what uh, Dr. Fisher just mentioned that. If it's, it's, it, but it has to be on the basis of a strong grounds of having majority of the population completed the vaccines. Uh, we're far from it. Uh, when we say we uh, freeing, uh, more, giving more freedom to people go about their businesses and doing so, uh, it, we need to have reached at least, in my mind, at least 50 to 60 percent of the whole population complete the vaccine before we can talk about really transitioning into giving people more freedom uh, in regards to maybe even wearing masks or un not wearing masks or, or gathering in much greater numbers. Uh, it seems like the vaccines are clearly helping in not just the uh, limit, limiting the spread of the virus, but also preventing it from uh, getting it more severe. Uh, that being said, we only reached about 10% of the people who's completed the vaccine so far. We're reaching about a little beyond 30%. We're, we're lacking way, way beyond a third of, uh, a third of, uh, a third of uh, the, the, the amount that other countries are currently having inoculated. So it is clearly not the time for us to discuss easing other restrictions yet, but once we reach to the level, uh, the level that other countries such as Singapore, Israel, or the U.S. has reached, maybe we can start talking about such issues. Right, and talking about the U.S., Professor Cheng Hon, do you believe the Delta variant has emerged as the dominant strain over in the U.S.? Yes, undoubtedly, Sunny. Uh, the writing was on the wall because Israel and the U.K. and Europe in general has always been the bellwether for the United States. So we looked across the pond to what was happening so uh, Delta overwhelm Alpha in the UK and saw it coming. So right now in California, for example, it's 5% of cases in May. It's up to more than 35% of cases already in one month. It's doubling at least every month, every two weeks in the US. And it's set to be over 90% in a few weeks. Professor Ching Hong, what are your thoughts on talk about the Delta variant creating a divided country as U.S. states with high vaccination numbers witness fewer cases, while those with low vaccination numbers note an alarming surge? Well, Sunny, it's already happening. Just this weekend, for example, if you look at the state of Missouri, which has a 30 percent vaccination rate compared to, say, San Francisco, which is, you know, around 80, 80 percent of, you know, at least one San Jose, which is 85%. Uh, in Missouri, they had an uptick of hospitalizations of 50% over the last few days, resulting in uh, you know not having enough ICU beds. So again, you're seeing two Americas happening, really defined by how people are embracing vaccinations. And the sad part is many communities of color here in the US uh, also very mistrustful of vaccinations. Uh, so you have a syndemic of lack of, lack of access, uh, increased risk of COVID, and potentially, um, you know, you know, not reaping the advantages of having this prevention strategy uh, right now. Right. Meanwhile, also, Dr. Kwak, you also mentioned Israel. Now, Israel authorities there have reimposed the mask mandate indoors, as roughly about half of new infections there are breakthrough infections and 90% involve the Delta variant. Now, given this piece of information, what does this tell us about the protection offered by the Pfizer vaccine against the Delta variant? 
Well, that very uh, specific number has been put up by the company itself. Uh, it seems like uh, Pfizer is able to protect us uh, for about to 64 uh, percent uh, upon completion. Uh, but it is still showing great numbers, such as in 92 percent or 94 percent, if I may uh, correct myself on the number, uh, 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 against uh, having a more severe disease. Uh, so Pfizer is still working. Uh, I, I believe that's also the, uh, the, the vaccination type that we are about to get in much larger numbers, uh, but going into uh, possibly looking at uh, Delta variant domination uh, coming into the country, I think uh, Pfizer or, or other mRNA types of vaccines is still the only two uh, types of vaccines that has the strongest um, um, power and efficacy against uh, any sort of variants. So um, I don't think at this point, the mm -hmm. number of efficacy, the, the percentage uh, is really that important. It's more important that we get hold of these vaccines and inoculate enough people uh, of, of our population. All right. And staying with the Delta variant, Professor Fisher, how are authorities in Singapore planning on tackling imported cases which are largely to blame for the spread of the Delta variant in most countries? Yeah, just if I could come back to what, what Peter said briefly, I, I really loved that description of the heterogeneity. It's we're, We've got to get a bit more granular with this uh, vaccination rates. It's going to vary a lot between between states, between cities, and even when people are calling the pandemic over, it's still going to overwhelm towns and, and cities where the vaccination rates are low. But but getting back to your point, uh, Sunhee, this uh, this influx of cases potentially, uh, it, it's it's to be expected. Actually, that's uh, that's um, the plan. Really, we we know that the vaccine doesn't completely stop transmission. So. So there's still going to be COVID transmitting, uh, but it'll just be more like flu or common colds, uh, unless you're unvaccinated, in which case you're at risk of uh, of, of severe disease. Um, so uh, I, I, those people will will surely get COVID because they're unvaccinated and they're circulating COVID, and the restrictions are removed. So so the tricky bit now is is how much you can let it go. You still want to keep a lid on things because everyone still hasn't been offered the vaccine and the vaccination rates aren't high enough. So uh, so th this is why this cautious stepwise approach over the next four to six months, I think, is what's important. But but ultimately, yeah, we're, we're going to see transmissions just like colds and we're not going to count them. Hmm. Professor Fisher, I believe I touched upon this briefly earlier, but speaking within your capacity now as the chairman of the World Health Organization's Outbreak Alert and Response Network, is it wise to rely simply on high vaccination rates in deciding to ease social restrictions amid the presence of the Delta variant? Well, again, it, it has to be, be stepwise. When the, the WHO uh, re referred to, to face masks, uh, I'm pretty sure they're referring to this transition phase. As I mentioned, vaccinated people uh, can still transmit. They can still threaten those around them. So until a country or, 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 or subnational region has a high enough vaccination rate, then then really masks should still be, you know, implemented, whether it's mandated or strongly recommended. Um, and it's uh, it's only when everyone's had the opportunity to be vaccinated, uh, then I think you can can really remove everything. Um, the, and and of course the first things to remove are the are the things with the strongest social and economic impacts. And um, uh, th that's why I think masks will be one of the last things to go. Right. And staying with masks, Professor Chin Hong, given the current situation over in the US, do you believe it would be wise to lift the masks mandate altogether? Well, right now, Sunny, there is uh, some heterogeneity in how different communities are reacting to the rise of the Delta variant and seeing breakthrough cases in Israel, the UK, and other places in vaccinated folks. So the city of LA, the county of LA actually, uh, recently, as you might have heard, um, issued a recommendation that people, even vaccinated, continue to wear masks indoors. This was not taken up by the state. This was not uh, replicated in the other counties, including San Francisco. So it was kind of interesting. Mask mandates do remain on federal uh, transportation, like planes and trains and in congregate settings like hospitals and nursing homes and prisons. Um, whether or not they will go uh, remains to be seen. I think that what will happen is, particularly after the July 4th holiday, there'll be an increase in cases. 
it depends on how uncomfortable people feel with that rate of increase, uh, even amongst vaccinated folks and in communities with poor vaccination prevalence, whether or not uh, people will be more stern than just simply a mask recommendation. So like Dr. Fisher said, we're in a transition phase, even though on average our vaccination rate looks decent in the US, there's still many pockets of regional low vaccination uh, that will drive uh, local mask mandates. Right. Dr. Kwak, what's your take on granting greater autonomy to individuals given the prolonged battle against the pandemic? I'm actually all for it. Uh, for a person like myself who is easily scared of a lot of the things, uh, if, if uh, all the people were like me, if they grant individuals all the freedom they can, we would just not come out of the house and we would stay home, maybe uh, un until the virus is completely gone. But uh, we do need to take matter that, that there are different types of people who might take this much easily or who might take this much more lightly. So I guess restriction still needs to be there for those people who are in the more dangerous side. Uh, but I do believe that it is uh, for the government's, uh, it's, it's better for the government to actually uh, sort of convince the people to keep and care for others by uh, keeping the restrictions rules uh, rather than enforcing that on them and mandating them. So I, I, I realize that I'm being rather neutral on this matter, but uh, I think it's better to give them freedom but have uh, them also uh, come up themselves to keep the social distancing. Right. Dr. Professor Fisher, do you suppose living with COVID-19 is a plausible reality? And if that is the case, what conditions need to be met? Uh, there's no choice, Sunhi. Um, COVID-19 is not going anywhere um, and, unless it magically mutates itself away to be, to be irrelevant. But... But no, I think it's all about living with it. And just as, as flu can kill, this is a disease that can kill. Uh, vaccinations uh, are gonna be the mainstay of defense. And, 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 and I think there'll still be uh, pockets and towns and cities and villages where suddenly a hospital might get overwhelmed and they might have to revisit uh, a lot of those social restrictions and, and things like that. Um, I really hope we don't get uh, Get the get the virus mutating to a point where we need to uh, revaccinate the world again. But uh, but I think uh, I think most of us think there's a good chance that boosters are going to be needed at, at some stage. Um, but uh, yeah, still a, still a lot to learn. But there's no question about living with the virus because it's not going anywhere. Right. And if that is the case, Professor Shinhong, what are your thoughts on the conditions necessary to be able to cohabitate with COVID-19? Well, I agree with. Uh... A deal that uh, it's something that we're going to live with undoubtedly 100 uh, percent the question is could we get enough people vaccinated so that uh, you know particularly the vol most vulnerable in our population so that hospitalizations and ICU beds uh, don't get depleted and resources like that I think one interesting development that I like personally is the development of uh, oral medications for uh, SARS-CoV-2 in which case it could be even more like influenza where there's an outbreak and with the exposed individuals you give them oral medications to suppress the virus and then contain it within that risk setting. So I'm looking forward to targeted drug development. I'm looking forward uh, to uh, developing a way in which we you know, coexist with COVID, uh, but not at, in a deadly form. Right. Right back here in the studio then, Dr. Kwak, about 30% of our population has received one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, but infection rates are still on the rise. What measures perhaps do you propose to better tackle this reality? Well, it's obviously keeping the social distancing, but I just want to refer to what Dr. Chenong mentioned just earlier. Uh, he's probably talking about molnupiravir, which is the oral pill that is under development. It is, it is showing a great potential uh, to became, uh, become uh, possibly the cure medicine here. Uh, so if we have two different swords instead of just one to fight against the virus, it'll boost us that much more power so that we can start maybe in, in going into management phase of the, the, the infection rather than uh, being afraid and not being able to come out of the doom. So I think uh, the, what, can, what our government can do at this point of time is that maybe they could uh, take a step in advance to go into that oral drug as well as going into getting these all, all these vaccinations so that maybe hopefully in the near future we will have two different sports instead of just one.
Right, and hopefully that will be the case in the near future. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Kwak, as always, thank you very much for your thoughts. Professor Chin Hong over in the US, thank you for your time. And uh, Professor Fisher, as always, thank you for your insights as well. Right, now given the alarming resurgence here in the Greater Seoul area, former Level 2 social restrictions have been extended by one more week. So do take care and thank you for watching.